You're listening to Answers from the Akashic Records, a world of empowerment service from Angel Rose and Ahanu. You are very welcome. I am Ahanu and with me is our lovely Angel Rose. And you're with us today, the first Sunday of the month, Answers from the Akashic Records session. And today we have got a fabulous lineup of questions for you to be answered by Angel Rose from source downstepped through the Akashic Records. And the questions we're going to be covering today, seeing that we're in this kind of crazy climate of politics, we're going to ask about the political climate of the world today. We're going to ask about how that same political climate affects people's health, their prosperity and their ability to be positive and to flourish. We're going to ask about Abraham Lincoln and what he would say about the USA today. I'm sure that would be interesting. Is the universe finite or infinite? And then somebody asks a question about the flat earth. We're going to find out about that today. Why does anything exist? Do viruses play a role in our evolution? Why do not all psychics see the same thing? When does the soul come into the body? And then, as a part B of that question, when does the soul leave the body? Are there energetic benefits to living in a dome-shaped house? So these are the wide range of questions we have today. Angel Rose, it's a delight for you to be with us. Oh, thank you, Anhano. It's a delight to be here for everyone on this first week of February. And Anhano, I just want to tell our listeners and remind you as well, this is the month of Valentine's Day, Anhano. So you could start planning right now. This is the month of Valentine's, yeah. <laughs> but Angel Rose... You seem to forget that it's also the month of my birthday, three days before Valentine's. I <laughs> the 11th, yes, the 11th of the 2nd. This gives I us, haven't forgotten about your birthday, Johan. Yeah, this gives us all the 11th in our lives. And of course, as many of our listeners know, Angel Rose is 11-11. So there you go. All right, let us begin. Just want to report that I already said the prayer. And as I said the prayer... There was a lot of blue, emerald blue, beautiful royal blue and emerald green light that is with us today. Okay? And I think I know what it's about, but go ahead and ask the first question. Okay. Our first question. What is the political climate of the world today? Okay, well, I'm, I'm really looking at a soup of different emotions. I'm seeing red. I'm seeing a lot of what looks like electricity flying by. I'm also seeing some green and blue. So we have a mixed bag. So I'll start with the red first because that's telling me that tempers are flying. Uh, A lot of anger is being thrown around the place. So we're embroiled right now. The world is embroiled in anger, actually. You're seeing things flaring up all over the place. But we've also got this green and blue that I told you about when I said the prayer. And what this anger is doing is it's sparking a lot of talks, a lot of communication, and even some healing in places. So the predominating energy, I have to say, is very electrifying, chaotic, hot. But it's causing more conversations, more communication among people of all kinds. We're not just talking about leaders of countries. We're talking about everyday people. We're talking about people in positions of power that work for governments, we're talking about law enforcement people. So, like I say, on the surface it looks like we're in a lot of turmoil, but what I'm seeing is that turmoil is catalyzing, in a way, a sense of unity among people. It's certainly bringing to the fore constitutional rights, especially in America, And people are coming together and uniting to oppose things that they don't believe are right. So either they're supporting some things or they're opposing things. 
but we're embroiled in it right now. I'm also seeing that because the, the situation is that way, especially in the United States, it's also giving an opportunity to some other countries to kind of take advantage of that, I have to say. Smaller countries is what I'm feeling. Countries that we wouldn't necessarily pay attention to. It's allowing them to take advantage of maybe laws that have been passed or their position and change their position or look for openings to see how some of the things that are going on in the United States could benefit them. In other words, like behind our backs, quote unquote, other things are going on as a result of what's going on here. Some of it may be positive and some of it may not. So that's the climate of today, Johanna. Okay, so speaking specifically of how it affects people, the question is, how does the political climate in the world affect people's health, their prosperity, and their ability to be positive and flourish. What I'm hearing is that we can answer all those questions generally. And what I mean by generally is that Source is saying that the first thing is we have to really get it, that we are all energetically interconnected. So in other words, it, it isn't possible that you not be affected by what's going on in the world. What's going on in the world affects people in the sense that it either strengthens people or weakens them. And because we're fluctuating, because we're in such a state of fluctuation right now, day by day you may find that some days you feel strong, and able for positive change and other days you may feel very weak and ill because the tensions that are going on around the planet on any given day affect us in those ways so it's the principle that source is talking to us about reminding us that we all affect each other We've had this conversation before, Ahano, in a different way and not on this particular topic, but there was a time when we were discussing how when you feel well, when you feel well, that you're positive in your attitude, you can get things accomplished, you're hopeful about the future, you have great inspirational ideas. Those are all the result of feeling well. When you feel unwell in any way, then the symptoms of that are a pessimism about the future, a sense of hopelessness, a sense that nothing will change in your life. When we ask this particular question, how does the political climate affect us, affect our health, affect our prosperity, really affect our quality of life and how we feel, that is probably going to be a day-to-day -day experience for people depending on how things shift. Some days we'll feel horrible, other days we'll feel positive. It's the result of this interrelationship that we have with life. Okay, the quality of what's going on collectively out there the main energy that's moving across the planet at any given day does have the ability to make us feel incredibly positive and inspired and hopeful or make us feel sick, tired, depressed, and overwhelmed. Our next question. What would Abraham Lincoln say about the USA today? Now let me just That's a loaded that. question. Huh? Yeah, this is a little bit of a throwback to a session we did one time called The Famous Deceased. And in that session, people were asking about famous people who had died. And 
the questions though were more about what are they doing now what plane of existence are they on and that kind of thing mm-hmm. one or two of them did actually in a sense pass a comment about what was going on and in this case now we want to ask particularly of the spirit of Abraham Lincoln and what would his opinion be about what's going on in the USA today all right well I first have to say that it looks to me that Abraham Lincoln has reincarnated Ahana. Uh, because of that, he's a young lad. So whenever a spirit has reincarnated, they're not really available in the same way to answer that question. Okay? So he's now in an incarnation and he's now young. So can you pick someone else? Because I can't really ask it of him. He's not. Right. He's not in spirit the, the way he was a few years back. Okay. So let's take George Washington. George Washington is appearing very, very far away. The first thing he's saying to me is he's mildly observing what's going on. I find that an interesting word because what he's implying, first of all, he's appearing like he's on some plane of existence that's, that is far away from the earth. He's sitting at a desk. He's writing things. And he looks up from his glasses periodically and glances down at the earth and what's going on there. He's mildly interested in the sense that he's really on to other planes of existence. Okay, so just a second. But since I asked him, since we asked him, He's giving me the word that there's a lot of political rhetoric. It looks like there's political rhetoric going on. He's saying in which nothing great will be accomplished. He's seeing that we're stimulating volatility in the world and this won't get us anywhere. He doesn't seem to have too great of a positive attitude about what he's witnessing when I'm asking him. He looks at it in the glance he's giving me, the facial expressions he's giving me. Looks like he thinks that we're still being very foolish. There's so much we could be doing to raise this world up, to make nations be great. Not just one nation, but the world, really. To make the world be great. And we're wasting our time and our energy on foolishness. Because that's how he looks at this and feels about it, he's basically waved me off and said, that's enough. Right. And he's going back to what he was doing. Which is obviously more productive (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Obviously more productive. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's an interesting viewpoint, actually, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we didn't stop with Abraham Lincoln then and that we did ask the opinion of somebody else who would know about U.S. policies and so on. Okay, our next question goes way out into the universe, Angel Rose, and it asks, is the universe finite or infinite? All right. As I'm looking out into it, it feels that it's expanding and expanding and expanding. So it looks to me that it's infinite at this point. It's still unfolding, believe it or not. You know, that original that original unfolding of creation is still happening. It's not done expressing itself yet okay would there be a time when that unfolding comes to us an end you know it's possible that it would but right now it's still in the process of unfolding so that means there's still more planets being created there's more galaxies 
coming into being. There's all sorts of degrees of life going on. There's not life going on in places, do you know? There's life going on. It's uh, Right now, it's still quite expansive. And what I find interesting about that, and you have to give me a minute because this is coming in really fast. But because the universe is still unfolding, it does exert a pressure or a force field on everything that's already been created. So if you could imagine, just imagine expansion happening in motion, unfolding out farther and farther and farther and encompassing wider and wider areas. It's so hard to put those into words, what I'm seeing. Uh -huh. But it's saying that that motion, that unfolding pulls on all other life systems that have already come into being. So if we take that and we relate it to what we're describing in the world today, it's just possible that this chaotic place we're in now, this mixture of energies that are going on, is a result of pressure that's being caused by the expansion of the universe. And it's how the life forms in a given system respond to that, that pull, that pressure. And because we're still in a process of galactic unfoldment, of universal unfoldment, it's almost like you don't land that motion until it stops. Motion itself won't stop. So this is why we, we see things, sometimes they're pretty intense. The energies are intense. And then we watch them calm down a little bit. And then they get intense again. And then they slow down a bit. This is how life has been for life on this planet and life on all planets. It's subject to the expansion and unfoldment in the universe. So we're in a we're in a soup full of cosmic explosions, I guess I should say, huh? Mm. And it affects all life forms. I find that's an interesting answer because it makes you look at the whole process of life, process of history, process of cycles very differently. So we do have a push-pull effect that goes on on our planet, on our all the life forms on a planet that is coming really from the fact that the universe is still expanding. And because of that, it's changing. It's coalescing. It's in motion. So I'm not sure what the next question could be from that info, Ahano, but it does make us, at least it makes me realize how much we really are in effect of universal forces. Okay, our next question. Why does anything exist? <laughs> kind of springboards off of what I said. Yeah. Well, what I hear Source say is it exists because it does. You know, does it have to have a why? Why can't it be that it, it exists because it does? In other words, existence just is. It is because... I am. Yeah, because it happens. It exists because it does. And why does it? It's just the way it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kind of circular answers, but that's what I'm getting. Okay, okay that we're, we're just in it now. In other words, what I hear Source say is the purpose of life 
let's answer that question in two parts because it could have two different meanings. But when you say, why does life exist? And Source says it exists because it does. This part two of that could be, does it have a purpose? And Source would say, life has the purpose we give it. In other words, we're the ones, all life forms everywhere, once they are aware and conscious, quality of the life that they create out of cosmic energies is up to them. So purpose can be the most wondrous, most powerful, most awesome creation. Or it can be just this lowly, not too impactful purpose. But we're the ones who take the life force energy and do things with it. From Source's point of view, why wouldn't you create the most wondrous things you could and see how far you can go? Push beyond those boundaries. Push beyond those limitations of thinking. And create something magnificent. It seems to me that the energy that is source watches all this. It doesn't stick its hand in and mold anything. It observes what the creation is doing. Okay, our next question, Angel Rose. Do viruses play a role in our evolution? Well, what I'm hearing is they either help it or hinder it. So, in other words, certain viruses catalyze mutations that are beneficial. It can make a biology much stronger. It can make it create and develop a, a greater immunity. So, it can have benefits in those ways. But there are also viruses that mutate to such a degree that they they cause the extinction of a species. To give you a, a contrast. So yes, they can evolve us by making us stronger and more adaptable, or they can mutate to agree where they destroy us. Okay, our next question. And I'm going to read this question because I actually found it amusing. It was this person who was responding to a YouTube video that we put up that had uh, an extraordinary um, a response to it. And the question said, please, 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 with strawberries on it, tell us once and for all, is the earth flat? All right, for those listeners who don't know what this person is referencing, there is a lot of new information out there that suggests that the earth is really flat and not round. That the appearance of it being round is some sort of an artificial dome that's placed over it to keep us in a particular hologram. Do I have that correct, Ahano? Is that basically what it's saying? Yeah, more or less. We would refer people to do their own homework and research on this because there are lots of different evidences, let's say, to show one form or another. And some people would point out that the images that we get from space, for example, through NASA are manipulated and others show that it's flat. And there's so there's there's a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of misinformation. So this would be a good opportunity to find out really, as this person says, once and for all, is the Earth flat? Let's take a quick little studio break here and gather ourselves, get a glass of water, and we'll be right back after this break. Don't go away. Years of research, thousands of profound statements, hundreds of sessions, miles of transcripts, months of listening, a vast archive of personal power and spiritual awareness awaits you. Join worldofempowerment.com today, a members-only website of practical spirituality. For your fast changing world, worldofempowerment.com. 
Ahanu's book, The Reincarnation of Columbus, is his true story of the loss of his first child, his pain and struggle with grief, and the guilt that followed. It forms his entire philosophy of life, and is a superb rendering of the unfolding of spiritual awareness. The reincarnation of Columbus is a true epic voyage from the pain and sorrow of a father's grief to a new world of empowerment, love, and forgiveness. Get your copy on Amazon.com or on Kindle for $2.99 by searching for A-H-O-N-U or visit http colon slash slash the reincarnation of Columbus.com. That's all one word, the reincarnation of Columbus.com. All right, so I have to do this in pieces because when this question was raised, all of a sudden these, all these orbs are in the room, interestingly, flashing off and on in front of me. But the first thing Source is showing me is that it is on a flat plane, but that's the way dimensions are. For example, if we talk about the planes of existence after death, for example, they would appear as flat planes of existence. Everything that exists is on its own dimensional plane, and that appears flat. So in that sense, the earth is flat. It's on a flat plane, existing in its own dimension. To our perception, however, it appears round, but it looks like that's because we have a limited perception. So you're going to have to give me a minute to explain this. Because Source is showing me our eyes and our brain and how those two things work. And perception in this dimension works holographically, spherical. It has a particular range in which it can see, and that range is spherical. So... When you ask what's real, what's more real than the other? The answer I get from source is it depends which reality you're in. In other words, have you come out of the spherical way of seeing and can look at the universe as an unlimited, vast plane of all possibilities? You know, when you look down a road and you can see for miles and miles and miles, right? And there's no end in sight. That's kind of the image that I'm getting. The earth is flat in that way. It also has boundaries. But then it also has other dimensions that intersect it, that take you off on different angles. But let's address the circular globe part in terms of some of the info that's out there that's saying it's all a manipulation by not so nice forces, right? To keep us in a particular cordoned off, sheltered, you know, whatever you want to call it, perception of reality. But what I'm actually hearing is I don't know about all that as much as Source is explaining that the way the brain works, the way the brain, this human brain we're in, the way the, the eyes work, the way we function now, it's a limited perception and it's a circular perception. In a way, it's given me the example of you know, some spiritual teachings where they talk about getting off the wheel, whether it's the wheel of karma or the wheel that we're just in this wheel that we, we just cycle round and round and round. And certainly with the earth, we've in history, we've watched it go through cycles that appear to be circular cycles or even maybe a little elliptical cycles. But we circled back around and 
where did the Vedas that talks about going from golden age to dark age and these different cycles in between the Kali Yuga, the Yuga, the I don't have them all. But it seems like it's just a repetitive cycle. And what Source is saying is that this is because our brain is limited in its ability to perceive past a particular perception of reality. If we could see it, if we were free of that, if our brain could expand, I find this whole conversation today interesting because each one of these questions seem to be separate questions, but they're actually leading nicely into each other, aren't they? Because when you were asking the question about is the universe finite or infinite? Yes. And sources say, you know, I'm getting a picture how infinite it is that it's still unfolding and it's still... And that's exerting an influence on us. Yes, okay. But in a way, it kind of keeps us in motion. And you could say that motion can take the shape of a ball, right? You think of a ball that you kick and it's in motion. It's going round and round. Or scientists call the pattern we're in a torus, right? It's a circular donut that goes in on itself and goes out the other end and goes in on itself. But it stays in that circular frame of reference. So what happens when you become free of that and your brain starts to function differently is that all of a sudden you're in this expanse of the universe that is just goes on forever and it's not circular it just goes on and goes on and stretches out in all directions and there's all these different planes of existence okay that are at different angles to each other but they're if you were to be sitting on them and looking correctly they'd look flat so the answer is, in the real world, in the, in the real perception, the earth would look flat. In the holographic perception, it looks round. Does that answer that? That makes sense, it does. Yes, indeed. I'm fascinated by that fact that everything that exists is on its own dimensional plane. And it it appears round to our own limited perception because perception is spherical. Okay, our next question. Why do not all psychics see the same thing? Well, there's a few answers to this question. I mean, sometimes psychics can see the same thing, but the way they deliver it or the images that come into each one might be different. But that's just because, again, we're coming back to perception. Each individual has their own way of seeing, their own symbolism, let's just say. So three or four psychics could give a person the same message, but it might not come in in the same sort of images or pictures. Okay, And then there are psychics who are just completely not on the mark at all. But that has to do with each person's individual ability to tap in to, or let's just say to be in communion with whatever it is they're trying to get information about. You know, there's people have different levels of ability to do that. And some are still very full of their own beliefs and their own ideas. So that gets mixed up, blocks their ability to see correctly. So each psychic's kind of at their own level of development and what they can downstep. Obviously, the, the cleaner they are, the freer they are of their own opinions and beliefs, the more pure a receiver they're going to be. And that's the answer. Okay. Our next question. There's two questions going to follow in line here, Angel Rose. And it's to do with the soul in the body. The first question is, when does the soul come into the body? I first have to clarify, it's really the spirit that comes into a fetus, not the soul. We've made this distinction before that, you know, we're not a soul, we build a soul. Sure. 
I was simply reading the question as it came I know, to us. But I'm just clarifying. But you're absolutely okay. right, yes, yes. So when does the spirit enter a body? Well, what Source is saying, first of all, is that it's always connected to the body that it's coming into, first of all. It's always psychically connected to it. I have to make that really clear. And it may decide to enter anywhere from the very beginning of development, the very first few moments, or three months along, or four, or not until it actually comes out. But I actually think that's rare. It looks to me that the spirit is in that body a long time before it's born. But I'm feeling very early on the spirit actually most often decides to come in somewhere between the first week to the first three or four months that spirit will come in. But it's always connected to it. And I think this is important because I know there's a tendency to think that it's just a a body that's being formed. It's vacant somehow. But that's not true. The spirit is very connected to the life form it's going to come into. In fact, it's part of what energizes it. The fact that it's there and connected psychically. So even though there's a physical process going on, biological process, let's just say, of its formation, its spirit is helping to develop that and form that. It isn't just about the combination of the parents. But it may enter the body anywhere from the first week, okay, up to three months. And it may come in a little later than that in some cases. But what I'm hearing is that it wants to be having that experience of being in that body, being in that womb, having that experience of of being created. Okay. And now the follow-on question then is, when does the spirit leave the body? You're talking about when it dies, you mean? Is that what you mean? Well, or yes. See, it's coming in the dying from process? The dying process, yeah, because I've heard you say before that in reference to a person who is dying that you feel their spirit leaving. Yeah. So does it actually leave in that moment of death or could it have left before or even does it still remain in the in the body although it's physically dead is the spirit still there for a period of time i get what your question is yeah there's different degrees of it okay in other words let's talk about a person who is slowly dying let's say they're ill they have some illness that's a slow progression that person when it gets close to the end of their life maybe a month before will start to have certain cords connected to chakras disconnect. Okay, so they start leaving. They start disconnecting parts of them, and and that person, as it gets closer to the day that they're going to leave, they may, and that could be months, by the way. They could be going in and out. But they're not totally disconnected, so I have to make that clear. You, You can travel out of your body, I mean, we know we can do that anyway, but a person who's dying might start to spend time, more time, in other dimensions than they are in this dimension, and yet still be living. In the case of somebody who dies violently in an accident, what I'm seeing is that spirit gets catapulted out suddenly. And I don't feel that there's no gradual leaving in that sense. Okay, if they die that way, they're popped out. Spirits popped out. Okay, in the moment that it, the physical body is declared dead, the spirit is out. It's it's sometimes out at the point of impact. Okay, if it's an accident, let's say, or something like that. For somebody who's dying violently in another way, such as being murdered, where they don't die right away, they're being tortured in some way or stabbed or whatever that spirit isn't leaving quickly it's struggling to leave okay there's a it's a more difficult way to have your spirit go 
because there's it's a again it's a sudden thing and there's a, a fight an internal fight where the spirit's trying to stay in the body as opposed to in other words the force of somebody murdering somebody isn't strong enough to pop them out completely so they're leaving gradually leaving until a point where they can no longer they lose the battle in other words okay so could that explain a near death experience where the force isn't enough for the spirit to leave but stays and then comes back into the physical body as it were and the person has a memory of that well not exactly because the reason it's a near death experience and not a death experience is because the soul still has things to do it isn't finished so there's a there's a soul element going on there or a spirit element where the person is tethered out there let's just say okay but still very connected to their body our last question today angel rose is more practical than what we have dealt with so far and this has to do with dome-shaped houses are there energetic benefits to living in a dome-shaped house it's funny how that is a question in there it may seem unrelated but going back to your earth yeah, question is the earth flat or spherical yeah, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> all right but let me see what source says well believe it or not i'm not seeing that there's any huge major benefit from it as opposed to living in a, a house that is geometrically a different way do you know of course, source would always say that the best structure is nature, of course, but not everybody's going to live out in nature without shelter, in other words. Because it, it is showing me other sacred geometry buildings, for example, ones that have arches or ones that have different combinations of geometrical designs in them, that those would have a greater impact on a person than a, a dome-shaped house. A dome-shaped house actually feels very limited, to be honest. Okay, and so it can make a person want to get out of it at a certain point, do you know? Right. Some forms of geometry, sacred geometry, can yeah. benefit. Yes. Can be of benefit too, yeah. Yeah. I think it's comparing, the image this source is giving me is it's comparing a dome-shaped house with the energy of a cathedral. And we're not talking about a religion now. Right. We're just talking about the buildings themselves, right? The way the energy flows. The way the around. energy flows in a in a cathedral that's based on sacred geometry. You've got arches, high arches. You've got the way the structure is inside. When you walk in, you just feel catapulted to a lofty place. Do you know? Right. Like I say, and it doesn't have anything to do with the religion mm -hmm. because pagans could build structures like that and you'd feel the same way as opposed to when you go in a round building you may feel a particular energy temporarily but it's not going to be as lofty or vast as a structure that has arches and other designs in it it's hard to explain because i'm seeing the pictures but there is a big difference energetically mm -hmm. okay so here's another example Let's talk about Newgrange for a minute in Ireland. Newgrange is a spherical structure, okay? And you could only go in, in the center of it, which is very small. And you can feel a certain amount of energy inside there. But it's going to be limited. It's going to have a limited focus. The focus of the energy is going to be in the center. And they may be portals. They create portals to take you out places and I make it a distinction, that's not the same as a domed house. A domed house doesn't have nearly that kind of power or energy, right? That shape, that spherical shape, is is limited. Okay, where a, a shape that is has more geometry to it, has other angles and planes, is going to have the ability to take people farther, their consciousness. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our questions today, but not the end of our session, because as is traditional, I'm going to read now a summary of the session, and then I'm going to ask Angel Rose to come back and to close the records. So here's what we've covered today. The political climate of today 
is like an emotional soup. The political climate of today is electrifying and hot. The turmoil of the political climate is catalyzing a unifying force of people power. We must get it that we are all energetically connected. What's going on in the world either strengthens us or weakens us. When we feel well, we are hopeful of the future. When we are unwell, hopelessness prevails. The quality of what's going on in the world can inspire or depress us. Abraham Lincoln has incarnated as a young man and so is unavailable for comment, but George Washington is mildly observing from a faraway plane of existence. George Washington says the political rhetoric is stimulating volatility and nothing great will be accomplished from it. George Washington says there is so much we could be doing to make this world great and we are wasting our energy on foolishness. Because the universe is expanding and unfolding in its infiniteness, it exerts an influence on everything that has already been created. In a limited perception, the universe will also be limited. It is possible that the chaos we see in the world is connected to the expansion of the universe. We have a push-pull effect on all of us that is coming from the expansion of the universe. Everything exists because I am. We all give life its purpose by using its life force energy to create something magnificent. Viruses can catalyze biology to make it stronger or can cause the extinction of a species. Everything that exists is on its own dimensional plane. The earth appears round to our limited perception because perception is spherical. The earth lies on a flat plane because that is how dimensions exist. When we come out of perception, we see the universe as a vast plane of existence. The motion of the planets are in a circular frame of reference on the wheel of time. Each individual psychic is at their own level of consciousness and use their own way to commune with spirit. Each spirit is always psychically connected to its physical counterpart. The spirit, not the body, is what energizes all sentient beings. Physical death happens from the disconnection of the chakras. Buildings in the form of sacred geometry are beneficial as homes for humans. And that brings us to the end of those profundities. So now, Ingel Rose, I'm going to ask you to come back and to close the records. I just have to make one comment before we close, Ahana, as you're reading those. And we're talking about how dimensions are on flat planes and that we don't get out of this wheel of time until something shifts in our consciousness where we could see 
in a different way. And it makes me wonder, you know, when you have these civilizations that just suddenly disappeared, Mm -hmm. it made me wonder, is that how they disappeared? Is that all of a sudden they got off the wheel of time? I just had that thought. Indeed, that's for worth fu- pondering. For future reference. Okay. That's a future question. All right. All right, go ahead. So we thank you for being with us today and we look forward to having you with us again on the first Sunday of every month for the questions and answer sessions. But do be aware that each Sunday morning we do go into exploring the different aspects of these questions. We go into the answers in detail between the first Sundays. So we look forward to having you with us for those also. Great. Yeah, and from some of that info, we'll be expanding on a lot of that. I can already tell right now. Yes, indeed. All right. right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Blessings. See you next week. Goodbye. You've been listening to Answers from the Akashic Records a world of empowerment service from Angel Rose and Ahanu. To get the profound statements from the Akashic Records in your mailbox each week, log on to worldofempowerment.com.